and death. Now about the towers. We'll go through this kind of quickly. Richard Gage has a great uh, article on that. I want to show you, you see here in the upper right, you have a stove burning wood. I have a wood burning stove. And sometimes I'll put paper in there. So it's much like an office fire, I suppose. Uh, office uh, materials, typical in office, wood, paper. You could even put kerosene in there. I have a kerosene burning stove. It's also made out of uh, iron or steel. You know, I don't expect that stove to, to deform and melt or, or, or collapse. It's just not going to do it. I've done the experiment many times. <laughs> My kerosene stove also is quite happy to burn kerosene. You know, a jet fuel uh, would be fine. It's a type of kerosene. Uh, I don't see a problem. Furthermore, you look at the, look at the uh, connections on these uh, columns. They're connected together. Well, you can see it in the picture on the right. That means that if you have a bonfire under one, go ahead, pile up all the desks and chairs and paper under one of those columns. And you start that fire off and it lasts maybe a half hour or something. But that heat is wicked away. Again, it's this heat transport, you see. Uh, and so you have to take that into account. Except in a computer model, of course. You can get away with, uh, with murder, actually, <laughs> if you think about it. But okay, back to the official model now presented by Bazant in a published paper. How to get a, a, a complete tower collapse. Their argument in this paper is that where the planes went in and there are fires, then uh, somehow there's this weakness, rather simultaneous, and this upper block of floors acts as a tamper to push down. So it, it stays fairly intact as a tamper. Makes some sense, right? But uh, wait a minute, uh, how about Newton's third law, which means which says that if the upper block exerts a force on the lower block of floors, the lower block exerts an equal force, students, on the upper block. Equal. That arrow is not shown. It's not considered in this paper. It's there. You cannot overcome <laughs> the laws of physics. Now, this is, again, a freshman error in physics, Newtonian physics, which I taught for over 21 years, to ignore the third law reaction force. But let's, wait, let's look at the data. Maybe somehow this upper block as it moves, I don't know, exerts, a, let's see what happens to the upper block from the data. This from the North Tower. And on the right, you see in slow motion, the upper block, is it, is it just wiping out the lower block? You can see the area where they meet. No, the upper block itself is being disintegrated. Did you see that? Let's look at it again, please. You can see the antenna poking up there. The antenna went through the whole ride of this thing. So, but you see, there's a force equal and opposite, up and down. And the upper block, which, by the way, has thinner columns. That's the way it was built. The columns get, the, the uh, core columns get smaller, thinner as you go up. Furthermore, the fire would have weakened the upper columns, and indeed that's what you see. It's the upper columns that are destroyed. So then, what is left, where's this block, this tamper, that's supposed to wipe out the lower uh, floors? Sorry, it ain't there, <laughs> you know? I mean, look at the data. Uh, you know, I, I, it just bothers me that they have this nice model on the left, but it's inconsistent with observation. It's also inconsistent with Newton's laws. Here's another photo. Uh, showing uh, later uh, as uh, one of the towers has collapsed. You can see the zone of destruction. It's quite clear, isn't it? Uh, you can see where the, right through here. But where's the tamper? Where's this block of floors? Well, indeed, there's smoke coming up there. It's, it's gone. On both towers, you see this effect. That upper block of floors is gone by the time you get uh, halfway down uh, of the buildings, approximately. It's gone. It, there is no tamper. And it doesn't wait till you get to the ground for the upper block to be destroyed. It's already destroyed. It isn't there. It's just amazing to me that they miss that. So the official story is full of holes, just like the steel uh, found. Uh, you see, it's just full of holes. By the way, uh, the towers also came down at near free fall speeds. No stacked up floors. Here's an actual photograph then following the collapse. Where are, the, where are the stacked up floors if there's some pancaking going on? Like the popular mechanics article said, it's not, they're not there. On the right, we have pancaking that can occur, but it didn't occur at the World Trade Center. There is no stacking of floors. Furthermore, the core columns are gone. 
Those core columns provided a lot of the support in these uh, towers. And uh, they are gone. Uh, that that uh, suggests again to me ex use of explosives. Now, let's see. As I started writing about this, and here's one of these uh, papers that uh, I asked you to read as homework, I received an email from a fellow who identified himself as a contractor with Homeland Security contacts. As soon as this article was out on the internet, he wrote to me. I'm going to quote uh, from his email. The publication of this article can be stopped, and I have the contacts to make this happen. You need to give this very serious consideration. This is an issue that is more important than any individual career. I think he was talking about my career. As painful as it may seem now, perhaps it may be less painful than could occur after publication. That almost sounds like a threat. I don't know. I have learned to appreciate the value of silence, even in the case of superior data and information. He could not refute my arguments, and so he said, shut up anyway. I have learned to appreciate the value of silence. Now, this paper was formally published in uh, a book by Professor Scott and Professor Griffin in uh, August of uh, so, so there's several things happening, but anyway, August of 2006, in September, September 6th, I was put on administrative leave. I think this was uh, probably part of it, and that was pretty much the end of my teaching career. Here I am teaching to a worldwide university, so thank you. Okay, thank you. NIST has found no evidence, uh, this is quoting uh, NIST, NIST has found no evidence of a blast or controlled demolition event. They made that statement, and then we wondered, because we're getting just a little bit skeptical, you see, we're thinking like scientists now, wait, did they even look for explosives <laughs> or explosive residues when they make this statement? Turns out they did not. So an investigative reporter, the uh, reference is at the bottom, her name is Jennifer Abel, called up the NIST spokesman, her name is Newman, she asked, what about the letter where NIST said it didn't look for evidence of explosives? See, they didn't even look. They admitted that finally in a letter. Newman, who's uh, listed as the spokesperson, right, because there was no evidence of that. Huh? Shh, go away. Abel, Jennifer, but how can you know there's no evidence if you don't look for it first? Good girl, that's it. <laughs> you know, investigative reporting, let's find the answer. Newman, if you're looking for something that isn't there, you're wasting your time. <laughs> now, am I I'm missing something here? I, I mean, this is offensive to my intelligence. How can you know in advance? You see, this could just keep going on circularly forever. But yeah. Okay, more information you can find at the Journal of 9-11 Studies. And here's some of the authors, as well as, of course, uh, in these peer-reviewed established publications. Now, ah, Red and Great Ships, a lot of fun stuff to talk about, but it's scientifically fun in terms of what it means to society. Well, that's up to us. It's an adventure to be in this with you um, worldwide uh, addressing these issues. An adventure to me. So in June of 07, I observed many of these Red and Great Ships, as you see pictured here, in a sample of dust from the World Trade Center. We finally obtained uh, four independently collected samples and the chain of custody is well established with witnesses, in some cases with videotape of the collector explaining how he or she collected the dust. Uh, by the way, we know that USGS has dust samples cause the, from the World Trade Center. We requested, we've requested uh, dust and they say they just don't have enough. Uh, all four samples, this is a check we did, had the these, these same uh, active thermitic material, this red material, and it was see, has been seen independently now by Mark Basile in uh, working in Massachusetts. Here's the electron microscope. Higher magnification using an electron microscope. We go in, you see the red layer on top. This is in the paper, so I'm going to go through this fast because you can read it in the active thermitic material paper. This is also from the paper. 
we see uh, aluminum, oxygen, silicon, iron, carbon, prominent, no zinc. Um, the primer paint, we check this, the primer paint, this is a knee-jerk reaction of the debunkers. Oh, it's just primer paint from the, you know, painted onto the steel, it's just primer paint. Primer paint has lots of zinc, but we've gone a step further now. This is a new result that I want to show you, and that is there is actually a monument for 9-11 that contains actual steel from the World Trade Center 7. The fellow who put the monument together, welded it, he went out, he's now a 9-11 truther, <laughs> and he went out and uh, scraped off some of the primer paint from this World Trade Center 7 steel. Now we're going to compare with this red material. And the result, drum roll, is that they, <laughs> thank you, on the left uh, is uh, the red material, the thermitic material. On the right is the primer paint. So are they the same or not? Well, they're, in, in the primer paint you see a lot of elements. Iron is Fe, uh, CO is cobalt, chromium, calcium, potassium, sulfur, silicon, aluminum, magnesium, and zinc prominently. Here's zinc over here too. It's going off the page. <laughs> see a little better there. There's, with this uh, method, you, you excite the atoms and they release x-rays and then you can identify the elements. The differences, I hope you can see, are distinct. The, the right is the primer paint and the upper one is, uh, uh, two plots upper, is the red material, you see. So the red material shows no zinc right away, you see that. That was the cr critical factor. We knew there would be zinc in the primer paint. There is no zinc in the red material. And indeed, we do see zinc prominently in the uh, primer paint. Magnesium is also seen along with, uh, uh, let's see, chromium, prominent chromium peak, as you expect from the composition of the primer paint. They're not the same. We also had uh, a reaction from a debunker who said it's kaolinite. If you'd done a little checking, the USGS data shows uh, this uh, kaolinite, sure enough, it has aluminum, oxygen, and silicon, but no iron. And, and uh, so it's just not the same. Furthermore, uh, the behavior, here's an independent sample. The behavior when we ignite this stuff, uh, comparing and when we treat it with a paint solvent, it, these are entirely different behaviors between the primer paint and the red chips. So here's, for example, soaking uh, one of these red chips. It swells up, but it's still hard. When I soaked uh, the primer paint in MEK, which is a solvent, methyl ethyl ketone, the paint became very limp. You can do this experiment. See, that's the beauty of science. It doesn't matter whether you're a 9-11 truther, so to speak, like myself, I seek the truth, or if you're a debunker, or wh why is it the debunkers don't do experiments? That's what I like to know. You know, you can do the experiment. It doesn't matter what your biases are. That's science, right? And when you do the experiment, then you publish. And somebody who wants to challenge you, he might be an atheist from, I don't know. It doesn't matter. You, you do the experiment, you get the same result. You see, that's the beauty of science. And then you find out facts that way. It's not like, oh, there's a big debate about this because oh, who says this and who says... No, it doesn't matter. It's experiments and peer-reviewed papers, you see? That's how we proceed in science, to get at the truth. Here's an x-ray diffraction pattern of a red chip. We're just starting into these studies now in earnest, and uh, we hope to learn more with this independent technique. Um, I want to point something out. As we look at high magnification, this is uh, 50,000 power uh, amplification in the electron microscope, we see, uh, okay, let me point out to you these in the middle, if I can get there, these platelets, that's where the aluminum is held. These, these dots, you see the dots here? These fa uh, faceted dots, that's where the iron is held. And then this stuff out here looks kind of gray, that's the organic, there's a lot of organic material. Now, the uniformity of these plate-like structures and the narrowness of them, th these are remarkable. I have no idea how to make these things. And, and by the way, the aluminum we can separate from the silicon using MEK. So it's, it's a very interesting material. The iron oxide, these ultra-fine uh, fasted grains, plus the organic matrix, 
This is not building stuff that just falls down and makes this uh, wonderful nanothermite. I've heard that argument. I think, have you read the paper? Do you know how complex this is? <laughs> you see, this takes some considerable knowledge, uh, chemistry. In fact, uh, we have a couple of chemists on our scientific team, and we have not been able to make this stuff. We don't even know how to do these. See, aluminum oxidizes very quickly. Somehow this silicon layer has passivated the aluminum. That means it makes it insensitive uh, to the oxygen in the air so that in this matrix it is preserved so that, you know, eight years after the event, this stuff still blows up when we uh, cause it to react. You see, we, we've got the flowing material and we've tried to stabilize the image for you so you can see this molten orange glowing material. There goes off the white wisp, which is, we think, then uh, aluminum oxide. There's an important thing to understand here, and that is thermite, ordinary thermite, which you can buy on eBay, is incendiary. It burns, well, you say slowly, even though it's over in a flash. <laughs> it's not explosive. It, it melts through stuff like steel. Ultra-fine grain nanothermite, now it's called, is an explosive, or it can be made, it can be tailored actually, and explosive. This, below you see a photo, lower right, uh, from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, which BBC asked if they could show this photo. It's a published paper. Uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs refused to allow BBC to show this publicly. Well, here I am. It's shown publicly. Please sue me. I need the, uh, to get the word out, if that'll help. <laughs> But, you know, it's so funny. This uh, remarkable structure on the left is from, again, Livermore Labs, showing, again, this intimate mixing of iron oxide and aluminum in a sol gel for, uh, framework. It's remarkable stuff, this uh, nanothermite. And uh, here are the analyses uh, before and after ignition. Top is before. You see the composition after. You see, the aluminum is almost go all gone. It has gone off in, um, into the air, aluminum oxide, as this reacts. What you're left with is uh, iron, reduced iron. Now, now, see, before the oxygen is very, peak is very large compared to the iron peak. Afterwards, the oxygen peak is small, and we were able to determine that the iron has been reduced. That is, the oxygen has transferred from the iron to the aluminum. Don't worry, that won't be on the test. But you still have to read the papers, okay? <laughs> right. And where does the aluminum come from in these spheres in the dust, the bottom one, you see? That's an unusual uh, mix, iron, silicon, aluminum in a sphere. Some of them, the aluminum goes off more, but some of them, you know, it's trapped or whatever, and the aluminum's there. What an unusual mix. Where does that come from, if not from uh, this uh, thermite or nanothermite? Quoting from Livermore scientists, they published a fair amount. So you see, let's see what they say about this. By introducing a fuel metal, a quick pop quiz. Oh, the answer's there. Too bad. I was going to quiz you. <laughs> what is the fuel, such as aluminum, into the metal oxide, silicon oxide matrix? Okay, what's the metal oxide that we observed? Uh, iron oxide, great, in these red chips, right? The silicon oxide so is, is, is a matrix in which they're holding this um, fuel plus oxidizer. Energetic materials based on the thermite reactions can be fabricated. Now, organic additives, what's this, all this carbon doing in there? Can cause the generation of gas, that's what it's for, upon ignition of the material. So you expect gas to be generated, resulting in a composite material that can pre uh, perform pressure volume work, in other words, uh, as it explodes, you get this hot gas. That's the trick used with a C4 in a shape charge to produce this hot gas and molten metal that squirts through and cuts very quickly through steel. That's the trick. See, when I first saw this stuff, I could not understand what it was because there's silicon, which is not needed, I thought, in thermite, and carbon. What's that for? Well, now I know what the silicon silicon's part of the structure uh, in the sol gel for, uh, method. Uh, formation and the uh, carbon, the organic, you see, which has carbon, is used to generate gas. It all makes sense now. Now we have to do a comparison. As good scientists, they, these scientists have pre previously have published what happens when nanothermite is ignited. That's the red curve. 
when we ignite an actual red gray chip from the World Trade Center dust, we get the blue curve. This is done in a differential scanning calorimeter. Yes, that will be on the quiz. And uh, you see the narrowness of the peak tells you how rapidly, it gives you a, a good indication of how rapidly the reaction occurs. The height of the peak, or the integrated area rather, tells you the amount of energy that's released in the reaction. What we found is that, and also the, the temperature at which the uh, material ignites tells you quite a lot about its uh, nature as well. Now, let me just show you one thing. I'll come back. There's a lot of data here. You probably have to read the paper to really understand it. This is in a paper uh, published in uh, 2004. And again, these are the boys at Livermore Lab. And on the right, we have nanothermite, a very narrow peak at about, what, uh, five... I'm saying around 550 centigrade it goes off. Uh, the broader peak with ordinary thermite on the left goes off somewhere around 900,000 centigrade, higher temperature. So by going to finer uh, material in the nanothermite, the temperature goes down for ignition and the peak gets narrower. That's what we see with this amazing red material found in the World Trade Center dust, the blue curve. It's very narrow. It goes off rapidly. I, I would, uh, uh, my friend Dr. Ferris says, yes, it blows up, you know, when he's, he's done a number of these tests. And then the, uh, uh, the temperature is actually lower than what the Livermore uh, boys uh, did when they, when they did their uh, nanothermite. So that's, uh, you know, it's a very interesting material. Read the paper for more detail on that. Here we go. First time this has ever been shown publicly, this is a, a red chip at very slow motion going off, very slow motion. These data were acquired by Mark Basil in Massachusetts using, I don't know exactly how he did it, but a camera through a microscope and taking, and then he hooked the uh, frames together to produce this uh, moving picture. So the red chip, you see the red there, gray on top, it swells, it turns black, gives off a gas, and then it flashes, boom. Now if this were confined, the, that gas might react uh, instead of just going off. I, we, that's an experiment uh, I'd like to see. But one more time. And you'll see the red gray chip very clearly. It's being heated on a stainless steel strip. Gas given off. Flash goes through very rapidly. Again, this is, this is at ultra slow motion. In the paper in which we discuss these red gray chips, you'll find a reference to this AMTIAC quarterly journal. This is kind of exciting. Okay, figure one talks about the applications for this. It's called nanocomposite. Nanothermite is an example of it. Uh, these guys, uh, Livermore, you know, thermobaric warheads. Uh, and then down at the bottom, a shaped charge. Can you see that? Let's see if I can use the pointer. So you see the, uh, this is hollow here. Here's the material like C4, conventional explosive in a shape such that when it explodes, you get a blast of gas, and then typically there's a copper liner also there, so that you get molten metal blasting out to cut through steel. That's how shape charges work. See the shape there, it's kind of a cone, or if you linearize that, it becomes this wedge that forms the shape charge to cut through steel. That's how buildings are demolished. Now notice what they're saying about the fuse right here on the end. See, they're pointing to that. This, the fuse or initiator, they're recommending uh, a nano composite or nano intermetallic, of which a prime example is discussed in this article, which is a Department of Defense article, US, is nanothermite, nano composite as the fuse or initiator. In my opinion, this is the more likely context in which nanothermite was used in the World Trade Center buildings. Obviously, to find out for sure, we would have to either find unignited, well, we have the unignited nanothermite, but I mean, unignited shape charge, which is unlikely. All that's been hauled off and melted, you know, all that steel. <laughs> or uh, find someone who knows, you know, ask the questions, the tough questions, and get uh, them subpoenaed. So here is the picture I'm suggesting now. This is my best uh, thought of how nanothermite was used in the World Trade Center. It was used in these shape charges and the top center you see a, a shape charge, conventional, being applied to a steel beam. Isn't that amazing, this 
this line, it must be about a, a centimeter, a couple of centimeters wide, and then across the beam, electrically set off, and that cuts through that huge steel beam. See? It's remarkable. Just remarkable. On the left, lower left, you see an example from the World Trade Center, which is quite interesting to me. But of course, that steel is uh, no doubt melted. That's what they did with over 99.7% of the World Trade Center steel. It was melted. It was sent to Asia, melted, destroying the evidence. We have the dust. <laughs> we can learn a lot from the dust. But I, I'm suggesting that the nanothermite would appear then as a fuse or initiator. Now, why would you use nanothermite? Here, this is from Los Alamos, another national laboratory in the United States. I've worked uh, at the lab as a postdoc for years. What, what they are talking about here is super thermite matches. So you have the nanothermite, also called super thermite, in these uh, silvery globules with two wires, you see. You simply send a current through the nanothermite and it sets it off. Applications, according to Los Alamos, include triggering explosives for demolition. I'm not making this up, students. This is straight out of the publication, 2003, which you can find from Los Alamos National Lab. Why would you want to do that? First of all, you can test this off electrically, this stuff, this nanothermite. Secondly, the superthermite matches are safer to use because they resist friction, impact, and heat thereby minimizing accidental ignition. That's why you would want to use this. If you're worried about things going off prematurely, here's your solution. Ha, plane hits building. We don't want too much to go off. Oh, super thermite matches, aha. Uh -huh. So then I got thinking, you see, why don't I try putting a voltage across this, one of these red chips from the building. <laughs> I wish I had that on video, but I was acting alone. I've lost my position at the university, but I was acting alone with a car battery and these two sharp probes and a 12-volt battery, you see. <laughs> and I touched one of the, I'll get it on video here, and I've recommended it to Mark Basil. He's set up better in Massachusetts. But uh, he was skeptical at first I, as I talked to him, but he's convinced now that there's this explosive pyrotechnic material in the World Trade Center dust. So you touch the two probes, apply the 12 volts. I was holding it by hand, the two probes on the red chip, and it just went <laughs> And now, of course, I backed up very quickly, and I decided in the future, I, this is just a little chip about, I mean, less than a millimeter square, you know, it's tiny, and I will have to have some, uh, you know, remote <laughs> way to, to do this. I figured out a way to do it. Another thing, by the way, we sent, uh, I sent chips by U.S. mail to a post office box in the Midwest to a scientist. When it got there, and this was on an inner envelope and an outer envelope in a plastic vial that was closed tight. Two little chips. When it got there, the scientist opened his uh, post office box and as he checked, there was a slit in the outer envelope. There was a slit in the inner envelope that lined up the vial, as he removed it, the chips were absent. U.S. mail. I feel like we have, you know, Big Brother watching a little bit. Now, I sent, in that case, I told him, okay, the chips are coming by email. I was communicating. More recently, I've sent chips quietly uh, to Europe and an independent lab in the United States, and they did both arrive. I just didn't tell them I was sending them. <laughs> and then they arrived and they say, well, what's this? And of course, then I could tell them. Here's again from Los Alamos about these super thermite electric matches, sh showing them going off. By the way, a colleague, I just got to tell you, a colleague asked Los Alamos, can you give us a sample of, of this uh, super thermite match? You know, you have photos of it. You have papers on it. What I wanted to do is take one apart and look inside and compare it with the World Trade Center uh, red material, you see. Los Alamos, not only did they decline to send it to us, they said, well, we, we really don't have any, uh, any of these. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> I see photos and it looks like they exist. Maybe they were just faked. I don't know. But how could, they, how could they set one off without having one? I mean, this is, 
Uh, I'm getting to be real skeptical. I'm sorry. I just we'll, we'll carry on. Oh, make this stuff. This is uh, just to get at the uh, aluminum. The nanoscale aluminum requires uh, sophisticated equipment. This is not caused by a building just falling down and magically aluminum is in platelets with silicon passivated <laughs> and the iron oxide in uniform granules embedded, uniformly mixed, and embedded in an organic uh, matrix. No, where does all the organic come from, by the way, if you have a building falling down? No, it's just crazy, that idea. I just, I just, I'm again, Paul, there's some scientist who said that. and I, Do you understand what you're saying? I mean, look at the complexity of making this stuff. So where could it be made in 2001? That's a key question. It turns out there are not many labs that have the capability to make this nanothermite, especially back uh, in 2001. Conclusion, who made the stuff? Why has NIST refused to look for explosive residues in the World Trade Center dust? Also, USGS would not answer my questions about that. Okay, here's something I want to emphasize, students. We, we can learn a lot from physics and experiments, but how they were used, exactly who did this and how they were used. I keep getting that question. You must understand that Observing this red gray material doesn't tell me. There's no fingerprint on this little stuff. <laughs> we need subpoena power. We need an investigation, perhaps, I think, at an international level. Some government, this was uh, suggested by uh, Bray Antcliffe, did I pronounce it more or less right? <laughs> uh, and uh, his colleague, both of them uh, lawyers, I hope I'm getting that more or less straight, Bray, that this would be... Uh, something where, okay, a nation such as Australia, Japan, that lost citizens in the 9-11 event could ask questions of the U.S. government, uh, request, demand samples of the steel, of the dust from official sources, right? USGS, we want that dust to look at for ourselves. We want some of that steel that WPI has. We want the computer model that NIST did. We will have our own scientist test. We want to know what killed our citizens on 9-11. <laughs> the U.S. Congress is rather obviously not going to, I'm sorry to say, uh, proceed on this. Um, Maybe we can get the door to open if we, if we pull it instead of push it. You know, this is what happened to steel. It went into the, a lot of it, uh, some of it went into this USS New York, this huge uh, warship. Just, you might have seen that in the news in the last several days. Who sacked 